he rode a solar bicycle around Iowa, hundreds of miles. And this was 10, 12 years, 15 years ago? Started in 2002. 2002. And as we should recognize or could recognize, is we don't seem to be able to convert our practical knowledge about today's energy supplies into practical use. Okay? So if it's been 15 years ago that he started using a solar-driven bicycle, why are we still so far behind? Uh, David currently works for the Iowa Policy Project. He taught at Cornell College. He was in the Iowa legislature. In I sort of view David as being a current David Thoreau. He's a great social thinker, works on these projects. David, we still got people coming? Yeah. Okay, well, um, yeah, thanks, Joe. And Joe and I have, he wasn't, uh, wasn't telling fibs. We haven't known one another for a very long time, working on lots of different issues. But rather than talk about energy today, the topic is water quality. And uh, I think that how Iowa is taking care of its water quality or, or not taking care of it is, is an important uh, thing for us to address. And what I want to do today is try to figure out ways in which um, we can break several times during this discussion and uh, all of us talk since. <laughs> yes, as Joe said, my name is David Osterberg and I, uh, I'm at the Iowa Policy Project. For a long time I was also at the University of Iowa where I was in the College of Public Health, but the kind of work I did was environmental health. So uh, whether it's uh, energy and climate change or whether it's water quality, all of those things fit in pretty well. And what uh, I want to do, and first of all, uh, Natalie also works for the Iowa Policy Project, and she's, you may have seen her since she's been around these parts some, works on sort of low-income issues, um, some tax policy, that's the kind of work that she does. So while I, I do the environment, she does that sort of thing. And we have, uh, we're passing around something that if you want to be on an email list to find out the latest thing that the Iowa Policy Project is doing. Uh, it's all free. We don't hound you. We don't send out that many things. Uh, there aren't that enough of us to produce that much more than about once every couple of weeks. And outside, uh, there are several papers that we've done in the last while. And what we've tried to do is get down to two pages on this. So they're all two-page pieces. Well, when we started the organization, we figured if it wasn't 30 pages, we weren't really working very hard. And now we figured out that it's not us, that it's a, the, what we ought to be thinking about is uh, whether readers might want to spend a couple of pages reading about, in this case, tax policy in Iowa, and uh, one on Medicaid in Iowa, and another one on water quality. So after you hear what I say, you can go over and look at that paper, and it's going to be pretty similar. Okay. Um, and uh, here is a map. Can people see that very well? Can uh, anyone can get a, uh, the front lights down and not have, have that be an excuse for people to go to sleep? Um, can you see that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is uh, this is the Gulf of Mexico down here. This is the Mississippi River going up here. The red places. That's Chicago, right? Minneapolis. Here's Iowa. There's not meant much red there since we don't have very many cities. But these are cities, but this is a very large watershed. That's a Mississippi-Missouri watershed. Well, Mississippi-Missouri-Ohio watershed. A lot of land in that area and a lot of people in that area and their use of that then can cause pollution down here. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a specific kind of pollution, which is nutrients. Lots of stuff go into the rivers that we may not want to have there, but 
Iowa has concentrated on nutrients, nutrients being phosphorus, nitrogen, those things that are really good at making corn grow. They're also very good at making anything else grow, like all the algae that lives here. And as they get enriched with all of that wonderful fertilizer, they grow and bloom and expand, and then it gets cold and they die. And when they die, the oxygen is taken out of the system as they are eaten by bacteria. The dead zone is not a poisoning of the Gulf of Mexico. It's an over-enrichment of the Gulf of Mexico. And that over-enrichment then has consequences, and those consequences are less oxygen, right? And so that's lower oxygen, that's lower oxygen, and the red stuff is really low oxygen. But generally, we're looking at the red and the yellow. And uh, the size of that is, uh, differs every year. And uh, the last couple of years, it's been pretty high. So this scale here, right, make sure that I, if, if there's anything about one of these graphs that says, I don't understand that, interrupt me. But on this axis, going up the, the, this way, you get square miles, 1,000 square miles up to 9,000 square miles. So this is the years. We've only been measuring that stuff since 1985. And some years you have high levels of, and this is bottom water area hypoxia. That's when the oxygen level is less than two parts per million, two milligrams per liter. When it's less than that, fish can't survive. And they can swim away. If you happen to be not a fish, but a little crustacean, you die, because you can't get away fast enough when that oxygen level goes down. Is that, is that pretty clear? OK. So depending on the year, it's either high or low. Uh, 2012, right here, pretty low. Any reason why that might have happened? Anybody remember 2012? What kind of a year it was? If I recall correctly. Oh, you got it. Because it was so dry, not that much water moved down, down the, the, the water system. And, and because of that, uh, because of that, we had a very low one. Last year turns out to be the highest ever recorded. And that was a fairly wet year. But it was also, besides how wet it is, it's how much nutrients we and the upstream areas are putting in. And so uh, the area at the mouth of the Mississippi River, that's known as the dead zone, or the hypoxia zone, about 5,000 square miles each year. And uh, in 2017, it was 8,776. And I'm giving you a comparison, and that's the size of the state of New Jersey. The dead zone is as big as New Jersey, big as Massachusetts, big as Hawaii. That's about the size it's been. And uh, that seems to be fairly large. And again, this is the goal. We're, trying to, we're not trying to get to zero, but we're trying to get down to about that level. But this has been the average over the last five years. Nowhere close. Nowhere close. And so even if our goal isn't that uh, severe, we're not getting very close there at all. So how come Iowa, among these states, produces so many nutrients that go down the rivers? Pretty, yeah. I mean, corn just loves that nitrogen. We put a lot, a lot of nitrogen, a lot of phosphorus, and because we do in this state, Damn it, I'm going to just have to shout. This is way too annoying for, uh, for me, anyway. I assume it's as annoying, <laughs> as annoying for you as it is for me. Okay, I'll walk around a little more in order for my voice to project out to the back. But so here we are. Who's responsible? And uh, somebody's already said it. We have a lot of corn crap. We sure do. A lot of soybeans. Every place... Soybeans don't necessarily use that much nitrogen, but people put it on anyway because you can boost the crop a little bit. Uh, you just don't want to be short on those kinds of things. So if you look at, 
And this is the, U, uh, the USGS, the US Geologic Survey, has actually measured and figured out where all of these nutrients are coming from. And when it comes to nitrogen, it's corn and soybeans, period. When it comes to phosphorus, less so, but when it comes to agriculture as a whole, and you have corn and soybeans there, you have other crops here, and then you have pasture and range, that's the amount that comes from agriculture. When it comes to uh, phosphorus, again, it's the lion's share. The blue part is urban contribution. Not much. And when you look at this, since that red is kind of interesting, because so much of that nitrogen volatilizes, turns into nitrogen gas, and goes back into the atmosphere if you count that as well. And most of that comes, of course, from here. It's a very small <laughs> input from urban areas. Most of it comes from agriculture. Mary? Uh, would you explain volatilizes, please? <laughs> yeah, well, it just changes its form. I mean, nitrogen can be ammonia. It can be uh, nitrogen gas. It can be NO3. It has many different, and depending on how it fits, it can change those forms. And a couple of forms you want to have because plants take them up. But nitrogen gas is one that isn't going to be taken up by plants because it's already gone into the atmosphere. Is that kind of, that's about as much chemistry as I knew, too. So don't push me too much further. But, so there's no question about where this stuff is coming from. And let's, Drill down a little bit because I, I, I want to convince you that there's a reason for this. And this is something that the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, does uh, every five years. They have something called a Census of Agriculture 2002, 2007, 2012, 2017. Where, where's 2017? It's not quite out there, uh, but it's about to be. December, we will have more data. But it'll turn to be about the same thing. This is the total number of acres in the state of Iowa. And it's about 35, 36,000 acres. Okay? Of those 36,000 acres. Million. Of, of those 20, thank you. Of those 36 million acres, 24 million acres are either corn or beans. I'm counting everything. And I'm counting roads, and streams, and lakes, and cities, and whatever. Two-thirds of every piece of land in this state is not farmed. Farming is a much bigger number than that. Just row crops. And so to the extent that row crops are fertilized, you can see why a lot of fertilizer goes down the Mississippi River from our particular state. Yeah, I can, I can make, actually, I can make that a little bigger. Does that help a little? Uh, all, these are all the acres that are in uh, various forms. And uh, when it comes to harvested cropland acres, 23.9, 23.7, 24.0, you know, 24 million acres is a pretty good number. And that in Iowa is corn and beans. A little bit of wheat, not really. Consequently, if you want to know why Iowa is responsible for a whole lot of what goes down the Mississippi, first of all, we have so much land, and second of all, what is causing that dead or hypoxic zone is nutrients, and we put on lots and lots of it. There's a very good report that came out in April of this year by uh, Jones at the well, Jones and Schilling and Weber, I, I know most of these people, they're at the University of Iowa and they're in what's called the Flood Center. And they found that Iowa's nitrate contribution to the Mississippi River system was just out of, uh, there, there was just no other state anywhere even similar to what we do. They talk about, they, they look at the Mississippi Atchafalala River Basin, that's the whole big basin. They looked just at the upper Mississippi, and they looked at the Missouri. And when it comes to Iowa as a share of the whole thing, we're 
we're small in relation to the whole, but we're almost 30% of what goes into the Gulf of Mexico. On average, some years we're very much higher than that. But when it comes to the Missouri River Basin, we're 55%. Let me give you a map. Let me show you this map to show you how extraordinary that is. So of, the, of this whole thing, you take a measurement here, and what is Iowa in comparison to that? That's where we get this 30%. But if you look at the Missouri, this is the Missouri land area. This is the only portion of Iowa that drains to the Missouri. Realize the Wapsie and the Cedar and all of those go into the Mississippi. It's the Nishinabotna and the Grand and the Little Sioux and all of those rivers out in western Iowa are the only ones that go in here. But when it comes to the Missouri, the amount of NO3 as nitrogen, uh, our, our land area is about 3%, but the volume that we put in the nutrients is 55%. Who's doing it? I don't know. I, you can't conclude anything else. It's a very strong paper, by the way. It was just out. And so just how bad is Iowa? Well, it's pretty bad. I was, uh, uh, we have, so are we taking action? Yes, we are. And the action we're taking was actually given to us by uh, the EPA, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, who had been studying this for a long time and said, we're the EPA, we're looking at the nation as a whole, and there is no reason for farmers in one part of the basin polluting the other farmers in another part of the basin so they can't do what they like to do, which is catch shrimp. So our corn farmers are going after shrimp farmers. And since that shouldn't happen in a country where we're all supposed to be Americans here, they came up with a requirement for all states. And the requirement for all states is to do some kind of a nutrient reduction strategy. And in Iowa, it took them about Iowa State University, the, our Department of Natural Resources, and our Department of Agriculture, called Agriculture and Land Stewardship. Those three agencies got together and said, we can bring the level of nutrients down by 45%. We can cut it almost in half. And that is our goal. And again, when they did the research to find out where it's coming from, and it's not going to be surprising because you've just seen how many acres we have of corn and beans, that when it comes to non-point, which is nearly all agriculture, 41 of the 45% we need to reduce should come from agriculture. Only 4 of the 45 from urban areas. 90 some percent comes from agriculture, and therefore, you're going to set up some programs, and those programs are trying to reduce the amount of nutrients. When it comes to point, there are only about 100, and, well, 102 municipal treatment plants, like yours here in Iowa City, like mine up in Mount Vernon. <coughs> Mount Vernon turns out to be one of the cities among the 102. We all are required to reduce nitrate and phosphorus. We're required. You can't get a new permit to continue to treat sewage and you know get a permit from our DNR without doing this. We have to do it. And when it comes to, and that's for four of the 41%, that's about 9%. And when it comes to um, agriculture, it could be expensive. 1.24 billion dollars in order is what Iowa, Iowa State says it's going to take. Uh, they ought to be do, doing things too. But when it comes to us, who live in cities, and I assume that's what I'm speaking to, we're mandated to do that. And farmers, be nice. It'd be nice. No requirements. Yeah. That's fall. That's the law. So the question then is, why should voluntary, a voluntary program succeed? Let's talk. Let's talk. Because I'm 
want to hear what you think about this. Uh, why, why, would, uh, why would people who are in the job of making money from producing more corn, why should they do something to reduce the amount of nutrients? They're going to save money. They're going to save some money. Yeah. You don't put as much on, right. Unless nitrogen is so cheap that putting a little more isn't going to really do much in relation to being short. Oh, it can't be Yeah, it can. Yeah. <laughs> we, we haven't subsidized it very heavily. Yes. Yes. So, so yeah, that would be that would be one thing. And in fact, some of us have said maybe we ought to put a tax on fertilizer to make it a little more expensive. Because right now, the the fertilizer tax for me, if I go down to Ace Hardware and I, I've done that, I don't you really use stuff in my garden, but. In order to have the receipt that said I bought fertilizer, 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, the, the normal kind of stuff that we get, I paid sales tax. What's a farmer sales tax? Zero. Zero. So um, that would be one thing. If the price went up, you could make that price. Why else? Why else would somebody do this? Why else would they reduce? They don't have to. They don't have to. If the government pay them. If the government won't pay them, yeah. And we have a system in Iowa or all over the nation, uh, usually <laughs> the NRCS, you know those initials, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. <clears throat> They'll come in and do a, a deal with you. That if you want to do something conservationist, we'll pay half. And in some places, like above a state park, the state of Iowa will pay 75%, you pay 25%. Okay, good. What else? Yes. Because it's better for the land long it's term? Better, yes, it's better for the land long term. And that you're going to, it's going to pay off, maybe not for you, but the fact that you're going to farm better means that uh, if you want to leave that land to somebody you know pretty well, like a kid, uh, that might make things different without mandating maybe you can get someplace. Yes? If you like gold shrimp. <laughs> if, you like, <laughs> if you like shrimp, yeah, good, good. Yes? I think it's also, this is how I've always done it, this is how my neighbors do it. I will be, people will be looking at me and um, questioning my judgment right. if I do something different. Well, if I do something different, like if I do fall tillage. Really bad thing. Iowa State has been saying, don't do this. Don't. Because what so you pretty, do. It's so all uniform. Yes, and you just, what you do is you get more blowing soil, you, it's all kinds of problems, and yet how many people do it? Lots. And I'm surprised that that hasn't happened, where somebody would say, gee, I see you just tore up that piece of land. I guess you're going to give me all that soil since I'm downwind from it. But I don't know. That hasn't seemed to work very well. Maybe water quality will, but I haven't seen much success in things like fall tillage. Well, why? Well, why? Because you may, in fact, be drinking water from a well, and it can be contaminated. And depending how deep that well is, you can certainly contaminate it. When you look at water studies that have been done, I, I've been part of at least one of them here at the University of Iowa, you find that you always find nitrates in water, almost always in well water. And sometimes, in about 15 to 20 percent of the time, you find them above a federal level that says you ought to be below that. Yes. Is that all enough? Yeah. Well, I mean, farmers are pretty good guys on the whole. Yeah. And they're willing to do this yeah. on their own without bribes and of the above, because right. they know it's the right thing to do. Right. Is that a possibility? It's a possibility. And at least that must be the assumption, because there is no requirement. Yeah. Are they aware of this? Are farmers aware of this? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, more and more they're aware of this. But, you know, there, there tends to be, when, you, when your economic wherewithal comes from not believing it, it's kind of easy not to believe it. 
And I think that, so yes and no. Is that, is that good? I mean, let me move on to a couple of answers to this. Um, we have pretty good data on farmers doing conservation. Uh, we, first of all, you see this in the newspaper really often. And here's one, uh, I haven't updated this, but this was like last, uh, last uh, uh, middle of the summer where they were going to find one of these bioreactor recharges, something that you could do to reduce the amount of nitrogen that goes into the river. You try to denitrify it before it goes in. And so you put together, and uh, you can go to the town of Jefferson in Green, uh, Green County and come there and have a meal and go look at all this stuff. So yeah, so, and you see that a lot, farmers taking action. How many farmers are taking action would be my question as a researcher. And we also have some pretty good data from that because it comes from the Iowa Farm and Rural Life Poll that goes back into the 80s, well respected. I mean, they send out to a couple thousand people and they get back 1,200 to 1,400 reforms. They really trust Iowa State University. Farmers tend to trust Iowa State University. They tend to not trust the University of Iowa, but they do. And when they ask this question about conservation, and they ask it in 2011, and the, the farm poll routinely asked farmers about conservation issues, da 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 da. And this one, a single question, was uh, just how much money have you spent on conservation in the last 10 years? How much? And we want everything. We want, uh, we want to all your expenses, including your labor, materials. If they're in kind, those that were covered by that cost share program where you know you have a deal where the, the federal government or the state government gives you part of it. If that wasn't everything, just tell us how much you spent on conservation in 10 years. And the answer, anybody want to? Uh, okay. Nobody wants to say. Okay, I will say then 50% had spent not a penny. Maybe this is a different group of farmers than, than the normal, but it's of the 90,000 farmers, this is a pretty big 2,000 or so. 51% said they had not spent money in 10 years. And then you take those who spent less than $5,000, which would be $500 a year, right? You put those two together and you have 70%. Yeah. It's worth pointing out, however, that this is perfectly consistent with corporate policy. If a corporation can attribute an, a cost to an externality, they don't pay for it at all. If, if, they put, if they put pollutants in the river, the city downstream pays for removing what percentage of that pollutant they have to remove. But the corporation pays it. So even if they so it's how many people are acting like Iowa farmers, where we, we, we think that there is something that says, yeah, this is my land, this is what I'm going to leave to people, and how much they act like a corporate agriculture organization. Depends. So this is not a surprise to you, because you assume that we're moving to corporatizing Iowa agriculture. I assume. Yeah. Well, how much of the farmland is really owned by the farmer farming? About half. The other so that's half, some reason. That is some reason, and that reason comes up often. And IPP is thinking about doing a study on that. Or we can we find differences in rented land and right. land that's not rented. And, and and again, it's more than 50% yes. is not owned by the person who is farming it. All of those incentives may be less powerful. Yes. I hear rumors and have seen here or there. That China is grabbing up Iowa farmland. What do you know about that? It's not right. Is it true? No. no it's not. We we are we are among a very small number of states that where we say free um, you know buying and selling of farmland. No, we don't want corporations in it. We don't want South Dakota doesn't. Nebraska doesn't. All of those states are states where you cannot have corporate agriculture. An insurance company can own farmland in Illinois, they cannot own farmland in Iowa, except for some exceptions, and they aren't many. 
but many of them are farmed by what are called family farm corporations, which require at least some number of family members to own some percentage. So they can still be awfully big, but it's not corporate in the sense that the Chinese are coming in. Actually, the Japanese came in to make Colby beef in you know, this country. Because nobody else was doing it, they took 400 acres out, and we were able to do that because it was experimental. But it was a, and John Deere has some land, but for experimenting on their corn plant. When they go out and make seed corn, they go and contract with a farmer someplace because they cannot own that land, except for some exceptions. So, it's not, don't worry about the Russians or the Chinese. Why well, worry about the Russians and the Chinese, please. But don't worry about it in terms of buying up a farm. Okay. Now, that was 2011. And uh, it was interesting because this is not me commenting. This is the makers of the poll saying, wow, that is quite something. These findings are cause for concern. Well, I'd say, I'd say they're cause for concern. They did this thing again with the same question. They did it four years later, and they found a change. And so are people becoming more aware? Somebody asked that question, maybe. And when you look at this, which is 2015, Farm and Rural Life Poll, now people who had done nothing at all in the last 10 years were about 12%. And then another 30% less than $5,000. And think, when the average size of a farm in Iowa is 345 acres, $5,000 over 10 years is $500 a year, which is a dollar an acre. How are, you, how are you defining conservation practices? Well, they're not, you know, not tiling, not tiling to try to get water out faster. That's not conservationist. They actually had a long question when they... That's a good, let me go back here. Uh, single question. Let me read that single question. Um, the question was prefaced in the text by, over the past 10 years, what was the approximate total cost of all the conservation practices, not including tile, uh, that you have implemented on the farmland you own to address soil erosion, water quality, wildlife habitat, all of those things. That's conservation. But tiling would not be conservation? Oh, well, tiling sure gets water out a whole lot faster, and it may be good for your crop, but it's hard to make the argument that that's conservation in some sense. Yeah? Well, even tiling even uh, uh, makes... Uh, the Flooding? Well, yeah, if you have uh, bumper strips along by your going under that, it's going under so that. that the buffer strip doesn't do as much. That's right. So there's a difference in phosphorus and nitrogen. Phosphorus moves with the soil. If you can hold that sediment back with a buffer, 30-foot, 50-foot buffer along a stream, you can keep phosphorus out. But if a tile line goes through, it is underneath that and goes directly to the river. That's why that first thing, you, you can figure out ways of doing that, to take the tile line, break it, and then run it through a whole bunch of sawdust and stuff, and then have it go in, except those are very expensive. And we may have two million miles, million miles of cut in the state. So, yeah, that's what conservation is. Is that okay? Okay, I appreciate it. Yeah, and that's what they, they made the definition that the people on Iowa State did. The other thing that that 2015 did is, am I concerned about the agriculture's impact on water quality? Yeah. 61% say yes. And another, beyond that, another 15% beyond that said yes, yes, 75%. The second question now seems to me also important. Nutrients from Iowa farms contribute to hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. 40% weren't sure, and another 7.5 were damn sure they had any effect whatsoever. Did they know what that word meant? I think they did. Hypoxia, they, you would never use dead zone in a, something to farmers get, just make them mad. Hypoxia.
Hypoxia, I, you know, you would, we assume they would. We assume they would. The public knows it by dead zone. Dead zone. Mm -hmm. I assume they, they know it. But that seems a very, very, very large number. And if you say that we have to get people to cooperate to do this because there's no requirements, then you want that number not to be that big. And uh, that's what they said. That's what the makers of the poll said. Gee whiz. That's not good. Here's another thing, and this is, uh, well, here it is. Considering the high level of concern about the impact of agriculture and highways and water, somewhat surprising that 40% of farmers were uncertain. Again, I'm not writing that. The makers of the poll are, are writing that. And here's one more. And in fact, I talked to some county supervisors once, and they had a question something like that, so it's a long ways. A long ways down to the Gulf of Mexico, and maybe you don't think that you could be having that much of an effect. Good. Here's another. This is Black Hawk Lake up um, near Carroll, Iowa, that part of the state. Anybody know Black Hawk Lake? Do you? you do? Yeah. Kind of a polluted little lake. A lot of nutrients in there, a lot of algae bloom. And they had a big push on that particular thing, and it's something called Iowa Learning Farm, a program of ISU Extension. They um, did surveys, they were trying to get people together to reduce the amount of pollution, and what they found is that they could even, there were so many farmers in the area, they could take their survey that they did to everybody and break off the section that was just for, for agricultural uh, people, 31% of farmers' respondents claimed not to know if high bacterial counts in the local lake was because of them. 25% said they did not know if fertilizers or nitrates affected the water quality in that lake. Sometimes you could see the lake from where you were taking this survey. 9% were damn sure it had no effect whatsoever. I don't know. I think there's some not wanting to believe. I just don't want to believe that, and so I don't. Yeah. That's what I was going to add. Is there a certain amount of selective amnesia yeah. going I think on here? With that, I, that's what my assumption would be. Yeah. I would see it's not even collective amnesia. It's collective intentional ignorance. Huh. There, are, there are realities in the world that if you look at them, they're too ugly to tolerate. So you don't look at them. Yeah. Demographics? Yeah. yeah. Well, this again was a survey of the yeah. farm part of. Yeah, but I mean, the farmers are 58 years old. They are, on average. They're an age. What yeah. about the younger farmers? Yeah, that would, I would love to be able to tell you that smaller yeah. farmers were better than bigger farmers, or that newer farmers were better than older farmers, but I can't do it. There's some evidence out there, but nobody's shown that. Much effect. So then you'd say, well, no, you just have to wait till the, the old guys die and then we're all going to be okay. I don't know. Okay, again, here's, and this is the Camito who did that. Uh, I met her actually, and uh, she was pretty disturbed by the, what she found in her survey. Farmers claim a deep seated knowledge of their land because they work it, but the degree to some farmers choose not to make a connection is, uh, she used the word, dispiriting. Be dispirited. And, and the other thing that goes on that I find, uh, I used to be on something called the uh, Water Resources Coordinating Council. There were 17 of us, I think. Uh, somebody was from the USDA, uh, two different, you know, NRCS and also the uh, people who gave the farm payments. Corps of Engineers was there, Department of Transportation. Why was I there? I was, I was a designated person from the dean from the College of Public Health. That's why I got to sit around this table and didn't have to sit in the back. So for about four years, I just learned a lot of stuff. It was a great education. And every year we put out a nutrient reduction strategy annual report. And I would generally say, after I saw the draft, you know, I think you could do a little better. You're not. You seem to me like it's way too much happy talk and not that much data. And uh, it's true that when I would say that, I'd get nothing, but the next year they were a little bit better. It's just a lag. I just had to realize that there was going to be a lag. 
But here's what I tried to change. First of all, this, they were giving this as evidence that things are getting back. Uh, first, total alternative fuel crops and pasture between 2011 and 2015. It's the 16 report, so it's through, through that. A um, little bit, a little bit more. That's good. It's total CRP. What's CRP? Can somebody explain what, what that does? You set aside land for conservation purposes and you don't use it for uh, production. That's right. And you get paid just like you were renting the land to any other farm. Yeah. You get rent a payment from the government. Okay. That went up by quite a bit. That was good. Uh, it's a vegetative buffers, boy, a little bit, you know, quite big, but it's just really a small number. David, in that CRP program, uh, you can only be in it so long. Ten years, generally. Yeah. And then you have to reapply. Some is <laughs> continuing, and some, if you're right along stream, you can keep your land in that CRP pretty much forever. Well, uh, it's not necessarily get it, easy to get into it, either. It, it depends. It depends on the year. It depends on lots of things. Uh, and they, they have been getting a little more selective because, of course, Fertilizer dealers don't want to have a big CRP because then they can't sell you any money. You know, you can't sell, I, I, I was going to jump to what I thought you might be saying. There's real incentives for not, not a, having a big CRP because that's production that somebody doesn't get you to serve you, sell you inputs on. So they're showing that there was a big increase in CRP and kind of claiming that that must be because of this nutrient reduction strategy and what I sent them was this. Could it be that corn prices had something to do with the amount of land that went into the CRP? I think at least you have to say that in the report, and they would not. They did the next year, but they didn't say a thing that year. And uh, also, the whole thing about conservation reserve at 1.464 acres, that's good, except it used to be 2 million acres. Don't you want to have that also? If you're going to only have a report that is happy talk that says, by golly, this is working and we have a voluntary system that's working so well, so don't give us any crap about having anything required, that's what you do. Happy talk. And I play, I'm afraid that that's what you tend to do in this state. We tend to, well, we're kind of nice. And we're Iowans, so we want to be nice. And so cover crops are one of the things that work really, really well. If you can get them on, if you can somehow get, after the corn is out, have something there that continues to grow that then you get rid of in the spring and plant another crop, it holds the, it holds the land, much less phosphorus moving off. It also sucks up some of that nitrogen. But CRP is a great, I'm totally for CRP, and it's been going up over time. And this is 2011 to 2015, that's a nice rate of growth. But when you look at how much there is in it, and this is using Farm Bureau numbers. If you use the state's number, they were half of that. But let's use Farm Bureau's number of 125,000 acres per year. <clears throat> new, new, you have that much more cover crops an extra 125,000, okay? If I did that for 10 years, how much would that be? About a million acres, a million two acres. How much corn and beans do we have? 24 million, yeah. So if we got to, if we have 1.2, would that be, would that be 10% of the whole? No, it'd be 5% of the whole. If we, let's say we only had to do half, how long would it take us then to get there? If it took us 10 years to get 1.5, it would take us 100 years. That's okay. That's okay. In that program, let's just take 100 years, and uh, we sure take care of the older farmers in that 100 years, that's for sure, and the younger ones. But is this going fast enough? And you can either assume, well, uh, maybe it's not going to get you to 125. Maybe because you already got the great farmers to already do it, and you're not going to continue. 
or there's going to be this crescendo effect, and somebody, you said that farmers look at other farmers, and maybe you're going to get this thing really taking off, or I don't know. But I'm saying that if I had to make an estimate of how long it would take us to get cover crop down, I'd say how many years. Good enough? Yes. Uh, I tried to investigate conservation set aside when I was told the land had to be marginal. Yeah, it had to be highly, generally highly so eroded. Most farmland that a person would have to buy or own would not qualify. Yeah, that's right. But then those acres shouldn't be polluting as much either. Because you want to get that out of that slope. You really want to go after those acres that are marginal. Or the ones that get flooded every, you know, every two and a half years in, in Iowa. I think that they don't have all the money in the world. And they have a lot of pressure against them putting in more in the CRP. But if you take on highly erodible, it's probably the good thing. Here's the last piece, I think. Yeah. This is a great study that came out of another not-for-profit, February 2016, uh, Environmental uh, Working Group. And the Environmental Working Group looked at uh, data that they could get pretty easily. They don't have a lot of money. They're just a not-for-profit, depending on uh, sort of old, rich dead guys, because that's who gives money to not-for-profits. Henry Ford, he's dead. Ford Foundation is a great place to get money. Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, they're actually suing ExxonMobil, which John D. Rockefeller ran because of that. So yeah, you want, you want lots of that. You like, uh, you like Bill Gates and people like that. Okay, so um, what the Environmental Working Group did is take data that was already there. Every year we fly all over the state of Iowa to see what's on the ground because you're getting farm payments based on that. You've got to be able to show what there is. That data is there. And that data is pretty good resolution, at least for things that you can look at, like uh, buffers along streams. You can find that. And when they did the work, they found that you might have a buffer along a stream that looked like this in 2011. In 2014, it just got a haircut. Or it might be a grass waterway, again, something that's pretty easy to see. And here you have a pretty nice farm with a lot of nice grass waterways until 2014 when they disappeared and because of the price of corn. What else? So they found that when they looked at all of this is that, yeah, we were making some progress. Yes, we were getting more land under crover crops. More land would be the same thing in grass waterways. But you've got to take out what you lost as well as talk about what you had gained. And when you do that, you don't find you got much progress. That was their conclusion. So there's a lot of people who just don't believe in voluntary. One of those uh, was the Des Moines Waterworks, which sued a bunch of farmers. Remember how that came out? Yeah. They lost. They lost. But they sure sued upstairs. And they had, it seems, quite a bit of support, although many people claim this was one of these things where it's rural versus urban. 63% of Iowans said, yeah, you ought to sue them. And when it came to urban areas, it was like 70%, but when it came to rural areas, it was nip and tuck about the same number. No, I think that suing was not a bad idea, but they just didn't get it. And by the way, the, the way the legislature answered that, did they decide to put more money into conservation? No, they decided they were going to fool with the board of the Des Moines Water Works and pack it with a whole lot of other people, and so they wouldn't be able to sue. That's what, the legislature, what our legislature did. They didn't have to pass it because they lost the lawsuit. But that's... And uh, the last word, I don't think I have to do that. But one thing we got out of that is a Pulitzer Prize. Yep. Because Art Cullen of the Storm Light Times showed where all the money was coming from to fight Des Moines Waterworks. And it was millions of dollars. And it was some of that dark money. So I would say that uh, we're, let me say that we have, here's the last slide I have. Are we putting a little more?
more money into this whole question? Yeah. And remember, we're looking at 1.2 to 4 billion dollars. They're going to spend another 4 million dollars. <laughs> now they're going to spend more than that over the next some years. But you know where they took that money? From education. Because they would not spend any new money. They would not spend any new money. And so I say education is 60% of the Iowa budget, the general fund budget, goes to education. Community colleges, K through 12, university system, that's where it comes from. And so if you decide that we're going to do this and not that, and we have a new program, and you're not going to put any new money in it, you just take it from education. Not very serious, I maintain. Yeah. The, the sawmills made money when they were able to make particle board out of their waste sawdust. Yeah. Uh, the aluminum companies made money when they took their uh, refuse fluoride and sold it to toothpaste manufacturers. Do you know what research has been done to oxygenate the dead zones in the Gulf in order to turn them into uh, hyper lucrative uh, factories for algae and crustaceans? I don't know that. That's a good question. Seems like an awful lot of oxygen over the size of New Jersey could be. Look at what is oxygenated into swimming pools and ponds nowadays. Yes, right. But I'm just saying uh, it's a big area. Yeah, but if you, uh, there are fenced in tilapia farms all over portions of South America right now. And, and even here in the state. And, and in, yeah. here in the states. If you were allowed to uh, fence off a square mile of it, uh, I guarantee you, you could grow some crustaceans there. You might, you might, and maybe even make ethanol out of it. I mean, there's, <laughs> sure, I mean. It's It'd be a be much better use of, of making ethanol than growing corn for it. Yes, yes. That, uh, we would agree on that, yeah. we would agree on that. But in, so in general, this is what I know. I don't know anything more than this, and yes, what do you know? <laughs> so we talked about corn and beans. Yeah. We haven't talked about CAFOs. We haven't talked about CAFOs again. Confined animal feeding operations. Yeah. yeah. And we're trying to get the moratorium, of course, in Johnson County and statewide. Right. Yes. Because Oops. they're a piece of this. Yeah, they are a big piece of this. And uh, and I think that it probably depends on the next election. Because, I mean, Fred has said that he thinks the master, master matrix is pretty much a disaster. He's kind of unsafe, a Democratic candidate, kind of on safe ground. I think it's 22 counties, including 11 rural counties, with all Republican supervisors have said, yeah, change that thing. It's not working. Besides Johnson County, Cedar County also signed this thing. Yeah, and I think that is another piece of the Iowa polluting the rest of America question. And that tends to be maybe a little less nitrogen and phosphorus and a whole lot of an antibiotics and things like that. There are other pollutants besides nutrients, but that's all I concentrated on today. Yeah, and there's different ways of raising hogs. You can raise hogs so you don't have a lot of water quality problems. But that's not what they want to do. That's not what the model. Is. The model that's right now is liquid waste, yeah. and that liquid waste goes on the ground. And when that liquid waste goes on the ground, the chance of it running off or seeping in is really big. Rather mix it above with a lot of straw, like you do in a hoop house, and all the other problems. Of course, the and all those other problems. But when that's the flooding. A, <laughs> I'm sorry. Down south, the flooding when yeah. when the Oh, yeah. I mean, when you have flooding and you have these big lagoons, yes. you, North Carolina did that again with that last, that, not the last hurricane that went through, the one before that. I don't know how many of those uh, big lagoons flushed right into the river system. And, and that's what happens with flooding here, too, in our sewage treatment plant in Iowa City in 2008 flushed everything right down uh, the cedar, uh, the Iowa cedar system. So, yeah. There are more CAFOs than there are, uh, yeah, about 10 times as many CAFOs as there are sewage treatment plants, so yeah. But I think that's, I, I, I 
I've been told that I'm supposed to stop when it gets to a few more minutes, but I'm happy to talk, but I, I'm, I'm going to talk less and uh, more. Uh, what do we do? <coughs> what do we do? So, how confident are you next to $1.2 billion? And not uh, four, the four billion, that's probably pretty good. There's four? four billion. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think four billion is close. Over ten years or what? Uh, no, that you could you could put in enough enough structures. And in fact, maybe eight. The Soybean Association, by the way, the Iowa Soybean Association, as compared with the Iowa Farm Bureau, I, I don't say much good about the Iowa Farm Bureau, I'll be frank. Yeah. But so Soybean Association has done a lot of pretty good work. And in fact, in one county, they've said, let's just look at this county. What is it going to take for us to do And and this little area? And they came in with numbers kind of in the ballpark, not four billion, maybe maybe six or eight. But yeah, that's probably what's going to take. So you could get the 30% reduction or whatever? 45% reduction? 45 Yep. Yeah. They, they think that you, you could get that. Takes a lot of work. Yeah. Isn't that much money? You're right. State budget's $8 billion per year. Well, so I mean, that's a comparison. Yeah. Put it back to an ethanol. Okay. <laughs> then you might as well uh, drop well, the subsidy on growing ethanol. Yeah. Okay. Just... Some taxes on the other side. Or I, really, putting a tax on fertilizer would not be the worst thing in the world. That would bring in $150 million a year. That's significant. Yes. If what I read is correct, Monsanto is a real problem. Hmm? And as more evidence comes out that their products call can cause cancer and there's more found that they're absolutely hooked into them because Monsanto will let them um, use old seed. <coughs> and it seems to me a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah, one of those calories. Yeah. I mean, really doing the thing of everybody who's eating these products. One of those is glyphosate, which is the Roundup Ready. Uh, stuff that's round up. And uh, the IARC, the, uh, the organization in the world that says if something's a carcinogen or not, has moved uh, glyphosate up, up the table, not to a for sure carcinogen that is suspected. Yeah, a lot, there's, it's been banned in a few places, but not in the United States. I don't think it's going to be. But, yeah, so I think you're doing a couple of things. First of all, farmers are really stuck. We're getting more and more concentration on who sells inputs, and more and more concentration on where you can sell your crops. Especially if you decide to put on a tariff, that certainly limits who you're going to be able to sell to. And you're kind of in the middle. And so here we are calling on them, but you got to do something better about what you're doing to the water. It's a tough time to do this. Of course, when it was high corn prices, there were things I thought would work. It is to say, okay, it's going to be voluntary to the extent, the extent that you get to choose what it is you're going to do on your land. You can make the argument that uh, these buffers aren't going to work for me the way they work for my neighbor or something. Fine. Here's a list that the Iowa Soybean Association came up with. You do two of those practices. And if you've already done it because you're one of those great farmers, you might have to do a thing. That is a kind of mandatory, voluntary system that might have some success. And that last thing that I just said is on this two-page paper that's right outside that door, and you can take it home. And um, in case you can't remember what I said, you might be reminded. <laughs>